we see that there are an estimated 800,000 deaths from suicide in the world every year. And this translates to about one death every 40 seconds globally. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among the age group of 15 to 29 year olds. Actually, more than half of suicides occur in uh, the younger ages, which is be below the age of 45 years. Hi, I'm Michelle Malik, and you're watching In The Special. That was Dr. Alexandra Feshman, a representative of the World Health Organization, sharing the main findings of the World Health Organization's report on global suicide rates released just yesterday. One person dies every 40 seconds in the world. That is a devastating number. In light of World Suicide Prevention Day, on today's show, we take a closer look at the social and mental health reasons pushing individuals and especially younger people who make up the majority of those who commit suicides. We further discuss what preventive measures can be taken at a family and a community level. Joining us for this discussion today is Mr. Danny Bow, head of campaigns at the Parliament Street and mental health activist joining us from New York. We're also joined by Dr. Michael Rich, who's an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and is the founder and director of the Center on Media and Child Health, joining us from Brooklyn. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Dr. Rich, I'd like to begin with you. Now, given our modern day times problems the, that are very unique uh, to the uh, times we see today, what are some of the factors you think are contributing to the mental health issues we are witnessing and the rise in depression and anxiety rates? Well, I, I believe there's no question that the rapid pace of today's life as accelerated by the smartphones and the internet that we have accessible 24 seven have raised the level of anxiety uh, among us all. Um, particularly among young people who feel that they need to compete to, uh, to make it in a world that seems increasingly dystopian to them. Um, so I think that we have to be very conscious of the fact that uh, unlike when they will be older, their impulse control is not fully in place. And, and so the ups and downs uh, of emotions that they may have uh, may be acted on much more easily, much more quickly than in an adult. Right. And draw the connection of that with suicide prevention. When we're talking about that drastic step, how important is trying to cultivate impulse control from an early age? Well, I think we have to, first of all, recognize that impulse control is not something that you can learn. It's a, a natural development, neurodevelopment, that uh, will complete itself uh, not until the mid to late 20s. And so in many ways, we have to scaffold and, and be aware of what's going on for these young people, um, and particularly to allow them to know that that we're with them, that we're um, sharing that and recognizing their discomfort, their pain. Um, often when kids commit suicide or attempt suicide, it's because they feel isolated, they feel like they're a burden on others, um, and that they feel that they're not being heard and, and not being noticed. noticed. Right. Danny, now you also suffered from anxiety. And as Dr. Rich talked about, that we have to become aware of the factors that are leading to these uh, anxiety issues amongst uh, young adolescents. What do you think happened in your case? Tell us about your story. Yeah, definitely. So in my case, when I was 14 years old, it was all about a want to fit in. So I really believe that the best way to fit in would be to be successful online, um, to look a certain way, uh, to sort of fit the mold that society um, wanted me to. And unfortunately, I from that, I developed um, huge amounts of anxiety and became very obsessive about the way I looked. I started to post images online, for example, um, trying to get that validation, trying to get that acceptance from people online. But unfortunately, I didn't get that, and that drove me to a very, very um, difficult place um, that you know, uh, it's important to be open on a day like this. You know, unfortunately, it led me to, you know, attempt to, to take my own life. 
Um, luckily, I, I wasn't successful and I've managed to, to get the treatment and support I need. But it just shows how difficult it can be for people at that age and how much risk there is for right. people at that age. Right. Um, because, you know, I, um, as the other guest said, your brain isn't fully formed. Your, your ability to uh, deal with certain emotions, your ability to, to understand the world around you can be very, very difficult. Um, and that's why we need to make sure that, that there is the support available and there is that understanding available for young people um, at that age. Danny, just digging uh, deeper into what you said here, that you thought to be successful, you needed to portray a certain image online. Now, various reports are showing that an increased uh, usage of social media leads to higher risks of depression. In your case as well, that seems to be validated. But what really led you to believe that initially, that you had to portray yourself in a certain way and that would lead you to become successful? You know, it, I was, it was the product of my environment. You know, at that time, uh, Facebook was sort of around and I was seeing people living this life, you know, this perfect lifestyle. Um, you know, everything was flawless. And I thought, why isn't my life like that? Why don't I look like these people? And obviously, there's the celebrity culture as well. You know, I was I was very much into playing rugby, and I used to look at my favorite rugby players and how well built they were and how how well they looked. And I thought, why don't I look like that? So it's that level of questioning. You're starting to think at that age. You know, I want to look this certain way. Why don't I look like that? How do I get there? Um, and unfortunately, for some people, that can develop into body image issues. But also it can develop into a level of anxiety and depression, which we know can right. sadly lead right. to young people attempting to take their own lives. Dr. Rich, in your case, how many cases have you also examined in which young children are becoming influenced by the material they see online, whether it's harmful to them directly or whether it leads them to uh, try to create a certain mold for themselves in which they must fit in? And that leads to what we're talking about, these mental health issues. I think we have to be conscious of not blaming the technology, not blaming social media, but understanding it's what we do with it. It's how we behave on it that, that makes the difference. And in the case of social media, what has happened, as in Mr. Bowman's case, is that many young people who are going through the normal adolescent developmental process of intense self-awareness, intense self-consciousness, wanting to fit in, um, wanting to be a certain way, um, are using social media much the way the corporations do to market themselves. And so they are portraying themselves as having the perfect life, as Mr. Bowman said, um, when in reality, no one's life is perfect. So I think that, first of all, we have to understand what social media is and what um, what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. And one of the things it can't be used for is finding real support and connection with other people. Um, and we need, we need to use it in ways that are not about making ourselves look good, making ourselves look better than we actually are, but to truly be authentic online and to acknowledge our limitations and our need for each other, because that's the basis of true friendship right. and true connection with other human beings. Right. On that point of community support and uh, trying to reach out for help, this is a point that I want to ask uh, both of your comments on uh, Danny and Dr. Rich. Danny, I'll ask you first, do you think that mental health is still seen as to be a privilege of sorts, seeking it in terms of costs and even talking about it? You know, I, I think, I think, I mean, what this report shows is that this is truly a global crisis. Um, and obviously, we can see from the data available from the World Health Organization that there is still too many people, sadly, reaching crisis point. And I think we've got to look at the reasons that is. You know, we could look at the barriers to treatment, for example. Is treatment too expensive to access? Are waiting times too high? You know, in, a society, in certain societies, is it acceptable to even talk about suicide? Is it acceptable to even talk about mental health? Is there the infrastructure there? Um, you know, the staffing, the qualified people to provide this support. 
So I think that it's a very complex um, sort of spider web of different issues. But I think if we can come together, if we can get governments um, and world organizations to come together and recognize we need a suicide prevention strategy in all countries, not just the 38 that have been alluded to in this report. We need all countries to take this seriously and that will inevitably save lives. Right. Dr. Rich, right. to that similar point, how can mental health not be seen as a privilege anymore, but seen as something that is necessary to talk about, uh, not seen something that is exclusive to just a certain class or a certain group or a demographic? Um, I, I think that even more than this idea of classism, that some, some deserve mental health and others don't, um, is the stigma that I think drives all of the disparities right now that that you know we still feel stigmatized by acknowledging our uh, psychological limitations and and mental health issues. So I think we have to take a step back and say and look at the whole system. The whole system is guided by this, even in countries that have good health insurance and and good health care in general. Um, mental health takes a back seat. And um, I, for one, believe that we should have annual psychological exams the way right. we have annual physical exams. Right. Um, and that we should touch base with, with a caregiver around our mental health, which is as important as our physical health. Right. And Dr. Rich, you make an important there. I want to introduce another guest who's uh, just joined us, Dr. Lubna Sarvat, who's an activist joining us from uh, Hyderabad, India. Uh, Dr. Sarvat, thank you for joining us. Now, India has the highest suicide rate in Southeast Asia, according to the World Health Organization. What I want to talk to you about is the dynamics and social factors at play in the developing part of the world and especially in Southeast Asia. What do you think leads and contributes uniquely to this part of the world, which leads to the mental health crisis we're witnessing today? Yeah, thanks and hi to all the panelists. Um, yeah, I just uh, read this uh, report, uh, part of this report to Reuters and also to Down to Earth. Uh, we see that in this part of Southeast Asia and also another part, you know, speaking globally also, we have seen a rise in the developed countries, a rise in suicide in the developed countries also. So I don't link the suicide to the health care or to the health insurances per se, you know. That's not at all a factor that I would reckon. Mm -hmm. Given the dynamics here in this part of the world and especially in India, uh, the two dominant factors that were very sensational are with the farmer suicide and the suicides of the rape victims. These are the most hurting and also the rise in the student suicide, especially what we were witnessed in Telangana part of India. Mm. So across the country, we were seeing this spurt in these three, uh, in these three uh, categories. Right. Okay, and uh, the most shameful one, of course, is the when you have the rape victims committing suicide. Uh, so much so that uh, the uh, the reasons for suicide by the rape victims uh, are like you know when the police doesn't register the case, and when during the hearing uh, she is unable to bear the questions, and in the hotel room she is committing the suicide. And the uh, other reasons being when she sees the culprits are not being arrested and a fast track is not, and she sees that the accused are out on the streets again. See, all these have are leading to suicide, and I'm not talking about any late, I'm talking about the latest figures, right. latest happenings in September, August, July, June, all these, and all these in the ruling uh, government party states. Right. And so uh, lack of access also, to justice here is one of the main causes. Dr. Sarvat, you also meant a rise in student suicides. What is the driving force behind that? Yeah, well, see, some, it's the result. The stress from the parents and the stress, peer stress, and then uh, the stress on uh, missing some career goalposts. And I would say that all these are the visible reasons. Mm -hmm. But the actual reason, whether it is in the farmer distress or the student or in the rape victims, which bother me personally a lot, and these right. are very sensational, uh, the reason is actually that they, in during the learning periods or with the uh, system, the system around, 
uh, I wouldn't say it's about even hand holding. It's about generating citizens who will value their own lives. Right. That they are not supposed to take over their lives at any give what may come. Right. Doctor. Come what may. Dr. Sarvath, that is a very that is a very important and strong point you're making. Uh, Danny, I want to jump to you and talk to you a little about what Dr. Sarvath was saying, that the value of human life, and pit it against something that she was earlier talking about, uh, student suicide specifically. Now, it seems like when we're talking about young people, one of the factors that they're forced to deal with is the fact that we have quantified success to, uh, and we've made it into this image, and they have to chase it again and again. Is this a large systemic problem? And is there a solution to it in the society we're living in? You know, I, I, I think that, that general chasing of success, that general need to get that validation from others that you're doing really well, you know, you're achieving academically, you're achieving, you're looking good, or all of these different components that add to that extra pressure that's put on young people. But the reality is, and this is something I found, I'm not saying this is something that everybody finds, but I found myself, was actually that you never get to that level. It's mm. constantly mm. chasing that level of success, trying to replicate that same feeling you had when you got the first bit of success. So I think we've got to be very, very careful, and young people have got to be very, very careful to not try to fit a certain mold, to be themselves, to achieve what they can achieve um, in their own abilities, but not try to fit the mold that someone else has set for them. And I think if we can enable that to happen, I think young people will be happier and also we can take a step forward when it comes to suicide. Danny, but when we look at the larger uh, political scheme of things, uh, governments in this are just as much involved. When we're talking about unemployment rates for the youth, the ILO has also reported that young people are less likely to find jobs than adults. In all of this, I mean, isn't the pressure at a large scale also due to the fact that governments and the capitalist system has operated in such a way to make people uh, work under this pressure and this assumption if they don't operate in a certain way, they won't uh, even survive. It's not about succeeding anymore. Too many assumptions in, in regards to the effects of, of, of capitalism. But what I would say is that you are completely right in the sense that um, there are a lot of different um, socioeconomic issues, such as, for example, unemployment you mentioned. You know, if you're unemployed for a period of time, that can be extremely difficult for an individual. And in countries where there's lower levels of um, living standards, higher levels of um, unemployment, less opportunity, all these different things can contribute considerably to uh, someone's uh, mental health and how they see themselves. Right. Um, right. So I think that is a massive issue, but I wouldn't want to make too many assumptions on right. that particular right. connection. So let's move to talking a little about what can be done to help people deal with the stresses that they're facing. Dr. Rich, how can a children from an early age be helped with building life skills, with dealing with pressure, anxiety, depression? How do parents need to intervene and start that from a very early on step? Uh, I think the most important thing is to stay present and stay connected with your children, to, to keep talking to them, to keep keep the door open to hearing what they're concerned about, but also to help them understand that this search for so-called perfection is a uh, never-ending search. In other words, th you will never reach perfection in academics, in looks, in uh, success by whatever measure you use, um, and that we are all that way. And so it's also a matter of helping them accept themselves and be content with being the best they can be to trying the hardest um, and to recognizing that we are all in the process of perfecting ourselves as opposed to seeking perfection. Um, and I think the other piece of it is to remain really conscious of their emotions and in the context of their uh, limited ability to control impulse. Um, and, and that 
um, oftentimes, particularly with adolescents, when they attempt or complete suicide, um, you know, they are taking a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Um, and so if we can help them understand that what they face um, are temporary problems and problems that can be solved either by themselves, but that they don't have to do it by themselves, but they always have somebody who has their back, who ha is, is in their corner. Um, because often it is the combination of that hopelessness and right. isolation that lead them to think this is the only way out. Right. Dr. Sarvad, to you and talking about what needs to be done in order to help uh, students and help children who are going through that stressful phase of their lives where they feel the economic pressure pending on them. What needs to be done? What relief needs to be provided by the government and support systems around them? Yeah, both from the government, uh, the society, uh, the two critical steps that I see where an intervention is very necessary is that when there's no, uh, whether it's the curriculum or whether it's the system, uh, there is no, uh, the taught courses or uh, the informal uh, chats or the pressure from the parents, nowhere it is being taught that um, ultimately uh, it's not only about the the marks that you get or the money that you get you know it's about being happy and when that when the perspective is changed and the narrative is changing about that we need not we are not in a competitive world but we are in a coordinating or a cooperative world right so these sort of uh, these sort of pressure uh, pressure not pressure binding but pressure weaning uh, the framework or the preserving sort of narratives i think this is very important uh, so that the students uh, don't feel any more guilt of having less marks or less money, right. uh, poverty, and all these. You know, this right. is especially for the students. Dr. So Sarvath, sorry, to, uh, yeah. since we're running short on time, I want to uh, put a last question to Danny before we wrap segment. Danny, a UN poll showed that around one in three young people across 30 countries say that they have been bullied online. And uh, since we were talking about social media and the role that it plays in terms of body image and uh, many other factors, what legislation and policies and parenting do you think needs to play a role when we're talking about the use of social media and children online? And I think what, what Dr. Rich said, you know, it's how we use social media. That's an important point to make. So I think we need to create more education for young people on how they use these platforms. Um, particularly because it can have a domino effect. If you're putting images up of your perfect life, someone else is going to see that and feel they need to too. Um, but I also do believe that social media companies have a moral responsibility to make sure that they protect their users and offer support to users they think that um, are at risk. Um, because I think too often uh, they turn the other way and, and don't take that fundamental responsibility that they should do. In regards to government, I think governments need to work with social media companies um, and find innovative ways to actually protect young people online and enable them to have a good experience online and go on to live happy lives and fulfilled lives. Right. On that note, thank you so much, Mr. Danny Bowman, for joining us, Dr. Michael Rich and Dr. Lubna Sarvat for joining us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we will discuss mental health in areas of conflict. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. According to figures by the World Health Organization, one in five people living in conflict areas is living with some form of mental illness. Earlier in the show, we talked about the importance of mental health awareness. In that conversation, it is important to remember the 70.8 million people displaced by conflict or violence and the millions of others who continue to remain in conflict zones. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Donahoe, psychologist, joining us from North uh, South Carolina. We're also joined by Edna Fernandez, co-founder of Beyond Conflict, an organization working to tackle the psychological impacts of war and displacement, and the author of the best-selling book, The Holy Warriors, joining us from London. Thank you both for joining us, and welcome to the show. Edna, I'd like to begin with you. Now, when we talk about conflict zones, mental health isn't something that's brought up in the conversation because it isn't seen to be a priority. But why is it important to talk about it? 
It's important because um, um, it affects future generations. Intergenerational trauma is a well-recognized phenomenon. Um, my co-founder and colleague, Professor Martin Parsons, is a renowned British historian who has done decades of work on looking at how trauma can be handed down through future generations if not addressed. Um, and it's something that's even interested uh, NATO. They have been asking the question, how do we break the cycle mm -hmm. of trauma? And if you think about it, um, if, if a person is, 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 is affected by terrorism or conflict or displacement, how does that impact on future generations? Well, it can impact on that person's ability to be a good parent, to be able to actually be stable enough to go out and work to recover from what horrors they have seen in the past and protect their family from it. And if they're unable to do these things, this will yeah. affect on the children's future outcomes and possibly those children's children's outcomes too. So this is why it's really important. And I, I'd like to just tell one story that was really one of the inspirations for us to set up this charity, a group of us here in the UK. Um, we heard the story of a 10-year-old Iraqi boy who was living at an IDP camp. He'd escaped ISIS. He was now physically safe. And the whole time he was at the camp, he did not speak. He was completely isolated. And then one day, the NGO workers and camp workers found him barricaded in a room. They broke down the door of the, uh, the room, and they found that this 10-year-old boy had hanged two small children. So this shows that he was reliving the horrors in his head. And the thing that constantly drives us at Beyond Conflict, and I'm sure it drives many others in the NGO sector, is what would happen if no one dealt with the psychological impact of, uh, of, of, of ISIS and conflict for that 10-year-old boy? What will happen to him in the future? And I think right. that, that answers your question very clearly. Right, and that does indeed. Uh, Dr. Donahoe, talking about that, constant exposure to violence in that atmosphere, how does that psychologically haunt the person and impact the way they look at the world? Well, it impacts you at a physiological level. We've been able to recently do many studies with hundreds of thousands of people across the world in conflict zones and experiencing trauma of all sorts. And what we know now is that at the cellular level, we experience trauma and we uh, get changes to not just our brain, which seems to be um, you know, obviously that makes sense, but also to all of the major organ systems mm -hmm. and that it impacts people throughout their entire lives. Uh, and it costs billions of dollars because people get heart problems. Um, they have difficulty achieving their life goals. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, it is intergenerational. And we believe that that happens through what, what's called epigenetics, that your actual genetic code gets changed when intense stress is introduced into your life. And so it's far beyond the obvious and very intense concerns of mental health and well-being. For instance, we've seen the suicide rates go up around the world in people ages 10 to 20 years old, over 30% in the last 10 years alone. And that's an alarming number. At the same time, that's sort of an acute issue. The long-term issues include changes to people um, that that will impact their future generations, as was said. So there's sort of two ways of thinking about it. There's the acute issue, which is that we are sort of losing a generation of people to uh, trauma and not getting the treatment that they need. And what really needs to happen is that people need to um, be able to feel that they can access care because stigma is uh, rampant. Um, and then if people, if it sort of festers inside and people can't get the treatment that they need, right. then what happens is, uh, the disorder grows. And then the second part is access is incredibly difficult, especially in conflict areas. Obviously, um, when you're doing triage, you're looking to take care of the physical body first. Uh, a lot of times mental health care is overlooked. So people do not get access. And then the third thing would be 
if they do get access, which is wonderful, often the quality of care isn't what we would hope for. For instance, it Dr. may not be trauma informed. Yeah. Right, Dr. Kelly, sorry to interrupt here, but the story that Edna told us was uh, horrific, it was startling. Now, anyone hearing that story would wonder, uh, for a boy like that, would uh, therapy, would rehabilitation, would it work? Is there hope for that person? Take us through that. Can the human mind go past that trauma? Yes, the simple answer is yes. So what that sounds to me, and I've never met this boy, but I'm just going to say that to me, it sounds like reactive attachment disorder, which is very, very common in war-torn areas. Human beings need to attach to other human beings or our minds do not develop appropriately. However, we know, know that with children, so a 10-year-old boy is still a child, that if given a, an appropriate attachment, and it doesn't matter to who, but you need a primary attachment figure that you can trust to provide your emotional and physical safety. If you can develop that attachment, then people can heal and they can overcome. Uh, human beings are extremely resilient creatures. Uh, basically, if, if given basic physical needs and then beyond that emotional security, you can overcome. Uh, so what happened there is we can see he likely wasn't able to discuss the trauma. It became internalized. He developed an idea in his head that that's what normal what that's what normal is, mm. um, and was never able to process it. Didn't have anyone to talk to about it, and likely was feeling very alone. Um, and and then we see right. the tragedy that occurred. Right, and then now through your work and your organization's work. Trace it out for us. These are people who suffer trauma through conflicts. Then if they go and seek asylum in some region, they would uh, perhaps fear backlash there. How complicated is the process of trying to reach out and trying to get mental help and mental health care? I, I think the most important thing for us at Beyond Conflict was the realization that we need to try and build capacity on the ground. There, there simply isn't uh, the, the resources to, and the time actually, to fly out trainers and to train psychiatrists from scratch on the ground and to have enough people to be able to service the need that is there. So take a place like Iraq. Um, there is a huge mass of mental health problem there. There is virtually no capacity on the ground. So how we are seeking to address it is we've partnered with uh, a group of uh, trauma specialists at the Royal College of Psychiatrists in London. These are people that have been doing international trauma counseling training for the last 10 years, working with bodies like the International Medical Corps. And we seek to fly out a, a cohort of these trainers to Iraq. We partner with an organization, an NGO or a charity that is already offering help in other, in other spheres on the ground, whether it is offering education or medicine or food and such like. And we, we work with these partners to get together a group of frontline trainees so we can't train psychiatrists, but what we can do is say to the frontline workers dealing with um, refugees or, or displaced people, um, whether they're working at local hospitals or whether they're nurses or whether they're NGO workers, we run a training program for several weeks with our trainers from the UK. Uh, our trainers are all... Um, they're all British Iraqis. They have the correct language skills. They have the cultural awareness. And, um, and all of these things help to overcome the stigma when dealing with the local community. We also have a mix of male and female trainers. And our right. trainers will then train those frontline line workers on how to spot the... The very and what are some of the, of the more common uh, issues that you witness in uh, the victims of these conflict zones, the displaced persons? Well, I mean, it's PTSD, depression, anxiety. It can be a range of different things. I mean, one of my colleagues was saying that sometimes um, the 
you know, the depression or the trauma can manifest itself in a physical form, like a, you know, crippling headaches or, 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 or something of that nature. But actually, the root cause is psychological. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist. I came to this as um, a foreign correspondent who had come across the issue. But it is obviously something that is increasingly being talked about. And uh, there is a need to be to, to address it. Um, the psychiatrists that we bring over, they will work with the people on the ground to find out the specific types of cases that are happening in the region. And then they will try and deliver mechanisms right. for dealing with that. When they then fly back home, um, they then offer the trainees the facility to be able to converse with them via Skype to have supervision so that if they need assistance in ongoing cases, right. they can have that uh, support that continues. And eventually, um, there will be a low level of, um, you know, uh, capacity built on the ground in these post-conflict countries um, to actually deal with trauma. But of course, in cases where the trauma is extremely serious and needs for, you know, a full, a full um, course of psychiatric support, we would then get our psychiatrist to refer Edna, to I, uh, I want to jump to uh, Dr. Donahoe here. I want to talk uh, about displacement a little uh, further on. But before that, I want to jump to Dr. Donahoe and talk to her, to her about uh, the emotion of loss. And especially when we talk about displacement, we see pictures all around of uh, refugee children and the lack of empathy all around is very startling. But what does the loss of a home or a loss of a person, how does that impact a person at a very fundamental level? Well, the simple answer is that it depends on the loss and the person. But if let's talk about a child, for example. So I've worked with a child that lost her mother at an early age, and that displaced in a way that she was no longer to make deep connections with other human beings in her life because the loss was so extreme that she couldn't she couldn't uh, make connections because she was afraid. Um, but in other people, it can be anger. The reactions can be profound. Sometimes children don't speak. Um, when you have repeated losses and you lose that security, what often happens is that children lose the ability to make new memories. The actual hippocampus in your brain loses its ability to make new memories. And so what happens is you can't learn, uh, so school becomes difficult if school is an option for you. But simple things like remembering how to do things, functioning as a human would, being able to make relationships, being able to retain new information, those very fundamental skills can break down. Loss is one of the things that our bodies don't always know what to do with, and we have a lot of defense mechanisms that can make it difficult for us to even understand what is happening. So um, as Ms. Fernandez had said earlier, what can happen sometimes is that you have a headache or you have what we call somatic symptoms, your stomach ache. You don't understand why your body's aching all the time. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily make the connection between a deep loss and these physical symptoms, and then people don't get treatment. And once right. what can end up happening is that you get complicated grief, uh, which can lead to psychosis. It can lead to homicidal thoughts and suicidal thoughts. As, um, you know, we heard the story earlier. And so there are a lot of repercussions from loss. And then when the loss is compounded, loss of loved one, loss of place, feeling unsettled, if you think for yourself, if you sit down on a chair and there's no back on the chair and you feel like, I'm going to fall off this chair right. as an adult in a, in a pretty secure life. That feeling is very unsettling. But if you imagine for a child or a person that experiences that over and over it's again. It's amplified compounded. tenfold. Right. I got yes. you on that point, yes. Dr. Donahoe. And now just uh, before we wrap up the show, now you've also reported, as you, uh, as you said, you were interested in your organization before that. You were a foreign correspondent. Now, with all the uh, political rhetoric, we hear about migration and displacement, and often we hear about the us versus them narrative. What do you think needs to be kept in mind when you talk about refugees and displaced persons, talking about the conversation we just had about mental health and how these are real people who have their traumas and who have their ghosts following them? By so many of us. I mean, 
we are obviously living in a very polarized world at the moment, sadly. We've seen the rise of the far right in many countries who have sought to make political capital out of refugees. And I think what we have to remember is if, if the last few decades have taught us anything, it's that our destinies are interlinked, that disasters and tragedies in one part of the world echo on the other side of the globe. Things like fighting terrorism, it's not just a neighborhood matter. It's one that can affect us on the other side of the world too. And these problems are our joint responsibility as global citizens. Um, one of the things we are very mindful of when we set up Beyond Conflict was you need to bring together people from different faiths, different cultures, different countries. It cannot be seen as a, a case of a group of people in the West trying to help a group of people in the East. It should be a collaborative effort. Um, in order to break down the issues of stigma, but also to make sure that we, we deal with these problems in a culturally sensitive way. And what, what I wanted when I set up our first project in Iraq, which will go live at the end of this year, is, for example, we want to see Iraqis. We want to bring in people to train Iraqis so that Iraqis are then helping Iraqis. Um, I think it's really important for um, a way of reframing the way we view um, refugees, because it's easy to just uh, demonize them as this block of people that are coming to take, you know, jobs and, and homes and things like that. It, 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 that needs to change. That dialogue needs to change. The only way that it can change is if people of all faiths come together and challenge that, that, that right. rhetoric, that false rhetoric, and, um, and also work together to try and come up with solutions to some of these problems. Right, and it indeed is a very problem which requires a solution-oriented approach. We're seeing the human cost of all of this devastation. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly Donahoe, for joining us, and thank you, Ms. Edna Fernandez, for joining us. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye.